Oh, hey, we're recording. Oh, is that all that is that all that it takes? Yeah, that's all it takes. Okay, welcome to Lane Time Chat with David and Jesse, who are Lane Time Studio, which is <laughs> a very fun conlanging adventure. Hey, there we go. <laughs> totally unrehearsed. Obviously. 98% correct. I'm very proud. When did I get wrong? <laughs> <laughs> It'll come up in your performance review. No more. Great. Great. Um, yeah. So we are. Wow. Is this the first podcast from the same space? I don't think so. No, I think we've done it once before. Okay. I can't. I couldn't really remember. And when I say think, this is like, think with like a 45% after it. Sure, sure. So think all lowercase letters, no capital letters. Maybe a capital N. Okay. okay. But that's it. Yes. Okay. I also think this is episode 19. Oh, don't look at me. But I'm going to give it a capital H. I'm, I'm, I'm the person that hasn't even posted the season two ones to the actual podcast thing. Oh, I thought you did. Oh, you just opened them on YouTube. Yeah, I just put them on YouTube. Yeah. No, okay. I haven't done well, you know what? It's it's fine. It's coming. Uh, <laughs> but everyone listening right now yeah. is a patron, so they don't care. So like we have access. That's we're true. cool. So yeah. We're good. Yeah. Excellent. So really grateful for that, by the way. That we have patrons oh, I listening agree. to this thing. Like it's it's really nice. And and that they participate in a community because that's yeah. really that was really our goal and fix that for it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, that was really our, our goal for Lane Time Studio was to have some sort of base and community and the fact that yeah, we, we see it growing and it's such a lovely community. It makes me so happy. Yeah, that's really nice. Okay, so today mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. someone do you remember who on Discord? Uh suggested. Uh, well, I know who it was by their dot 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 dis their Discord name. Because it was Formica Tables. Oh, yes, yes. Um, made a suggestion yeah, who, that we talk about food, right? Yeah. Who is Formica Table? Is that... And it's not Formica? I think it's Miles, isn't it? Oh, yeah, no. Isn't we should add notes to remember names. Yeah. Um, but cool. We we got um, a suggestion to talk about food. Now, obviously, we are both very passionate about food, um, and we could just spend the entire hour arguing about particular tastes, but that is not the direction we decided to go. I will say this, and I feel like I have to say this in order to be fair. Um, Jesse has some very bizarre and aberrant tastes and, and, you know, proclivities when it comes to food. Um, but there are a certain bizarre combinations that she comes up with that are just absolutely delightful. And I will, I will note that since we've been living together, she has used onions several times in quantities greater than I would have preferred. Like, like with that chili, like you only needed like half that amount. You bought the onions. They were big. I use a whole onion when I use an onion. Good to know. <laughs> then I'm going to get you shallots from now on. I'll use the whole thing of shallots and to no, get the amount I'm going to give you like one shallot. Oh goodness. You okay. can chop that up very fine. <laughs> but well, you like the chili. I'll get you onion powder. Did you or did you not say the taste was incredible? It was incredible. Okay so. It was unlike anything I'd ever had. Uh, she also mixed uh, mustard which is vile as you all know and um, honey which is vile as you all know. Um, and we combined it with her father's smoked salmon, and the taste was just extraordinary. You're welcome for expanding your culinary yeah. base. I just don't even know what to do with that. It's, um, 
It's made me rethink a lot of things about myself and my place in this world. An existential crisis. Mm. E eating, e eating my food is not for the weak. No. <laughs> Just wonderful, though. Oh, man. Okay, so thank you for admitting that, by the way, because I wasn't going to throw you under the bus and admit that you've eaten a lot of onions in the last however long um, but a lot of onions have have been prepared and cooked yeah um you know a movie from the 90s that i think we all saw which uh, is a very important film um for all of us individually but also culturally um and in the history of film uh the crow you'll remember at the beginning of the crow uh the young girl and it says to the cop as they're sharing a hot dog like, are you going to put some stuff on it? Are you going to put onions on it? And she says, no, onions make you fart big time. <laughs> it's the crow. Okay, but back up a second. That's not why you've been avoiding onions, because you claimed it was the flavor. No, let me, let me, let me go back to when I was, uh, I don't know if it would have been three or four years old, probably four. But um, there were two things that I really didn't like. I didn't like fat on meat. Oh, so we ate, fair, all, fair. we ate a lot of pork chops and then there was like this fat. Pork is a very fatty meat. And, um, and I would call it uh, boingy. And I didn't like its texture. I didn't like it, the way it moved. Uh, I certainly didn't like the way it chewed. It was mm. mm -hmm. uh, onions when cooked like that are very much like boingy. Gotcha. They're kind of slimy and, and then they have a, a terrible taste and flavor, a uh, taste and smell as well. Um, it, it's kind of the, uh, it's the nadir, I think, uh, the very nadir of um, like olfactory uh, sensation. Um, just the, the whole gestalt of it. Uh, and so, yeah, that's something I've carried with me since I was three or four years old. Yeah. I like, though, that in a discussion of onions, you have used boingy, mm -hmm. followed by nadir, yeah. followed by gestalt. I, I just want to point that out, that this is a wild ride of vocabulary. I'm on, I'm on board with it. I like it. Yeah, I had, a, I had, I had some unique vocabulary items. Uh, as a young child. So boingy was one of them. That was a big one. Another one is, um, is something where you take your, your two fingers like this and you, um, you go usually on a sleeve of a shirt and you rub it back and forth like, uh, like this. Uh, I mean, you can only see this if you're watching the video, but this is called turkeying and I would go turkey, turkey, turkey like that. And um, another one is when I would get out of the shower and I would feel very good and very clean, I would say, so manen, like that. I should not have had a drink of coffee right before you said that, but it almost came out. That's- and It would have been lovely. out on your ear. That's lovely. On my ear, I like that, not, not any other body part, but out on my ear. It's an expression. I'm sure. Yeah. No, I really, you were the first person who I've heard say it regularly that way. And it, it just really cracks me up. You never heard that expression? I didn't say I hadn't heard it. Huh. It was like one of those things where it's like, I vaguely remember hearing it in my past at one point. So I knew what oh. it was, yeah. but like, you're the first person in my life that I've heard use it regularly like that. Mm. And so just FYI. Oh, this reminds me, have you seen, just like that. Yes, it, it, for a podcast recording, having good yeah. hair is remarkably important. Very. Have you seen uh, Oh Brother, Where Are They? Yes. Okay, so that's, of course, I heard the expression, you know, you know, ride you out of town on a rail. But then it's like, <laughs> they didn't really do that, right? Like, it was just, they just did that for the movie, right? They didn't really, like, put people on a rail and take them out like that. Do you remember the scene I'm talking about? Yeah, but okay, I don't yeah. know. Like, I have to look it up. That sounds like a Google thing. Okay. Yeah. So we have obviously strayed very far from the topic of food, especially from how I was saying this is how we should do the topic. Um, it's all you. It, it was me. 
I said this is how we should do it. You said you had a note that you were ready to share to support it. You were the one who strayed. What? No, I don't anyway. Know. Anyway. I, I couldn't hear that. The very loud plane. The very loud plane. Um, earlier, I swear there were two planes racing right outside the window. Yeah. So, yeah. back to food. Yeah. But back to food in the way that we're going to bring it back to Conley. Yeah. Um, mm. As David fixes his hair eight times over. Until he's happy with myself it. on the screen. Um, so, we were thinking that it would be perhaps more interesting than just listening to us talk about food and art, particular uh -huh. interest in food, um, and instead talk about coming up with food terms in your conling, because this was something that we did in, um, it, it would have been one of the special episodes, probably a patron only live stream, I believe, yeah. when we were coming up with like ingala and food terms, um, and really thinking about like, but what would they make and what would they call it? Because so much of what we use as food terms is wholly dependent on, you know, not only your own experience with food and your family's experience with food, but it's like steeped in history and culture for even how you define very, what you would think are very simple, basic definitions, um, like being able to call something a slider. And it's like, you got to know what a slider is and that it can be a hamburger or a pork slider, but a pork slider is not going to look like a hamburger slider. And you just got to know this. Yeah. And like, why do we even differentiate between sliders and hamburgers if it's a hamburger slider? Like, you know, it's like all these little things that it's like you take for granted. Um, and I believe when we were talking about Ingale, it came up really with thinking about like soup versus stew. And then of course you get into like, chilies and things like that because to me chili is not really a stew but it's closer to a stew than a soup but like to me they're three separate terms because of how I experience food yeah. um, but that makes it all the more difficult when you're trying to especially if your conlang speakers are outside the realm of say a real world culture and history that you're like there are planes racing. Yeah, there are planes. They're like jets racing outside. This In formations not, of three. Yeah, this is not a usual occurrence. Uh, okay. I'm, and I'm sorry for interrupting you. It's really only when I see something extraordinarily bizarre. There were nine jets yeah. in formations of three. Wow. And so that's what all the noise is. Um, but going back to that idea, like if your conlang speakers are rooted in the real world, you can obviously really inherit a lot of food terms and food practices from you know, the cultures that they would have, have contact with. But what do you do when it's like, you know, the lang time world and it's, you're, you're starting kind of from scratch. Like, what do you do? Yeah, so the first thing to, I think, bear in mind is that uh, the number of different ways that uh, food items can get their names. So um, first, this is going to be passing the buck a little bit, but one could be just like the food item gets its name directly from the name of the plant or animal that it comes from. So that's, that's pretty easy, but it does pass it off one level because then you have to say, well, how do plants and animals get their names, which is really a separate topic. But since we're focused on food, that's one and it's an easy one. And you know, it's, it's fairly simple and it works with a lot of stuff. Like how do you call uh, chicken then you eat chicken um, or, and, or like apples really. I mean, that one's a bit of a, no, that gets, that gets more into plant names, but yeah, what the food apple, it's like, what is it? Well, it's just apple. We do that with a lot of fruits and vegetables. So that's- So it's really funny that you mentioned this in particular because uh -huh. Um, like just today, I recorded a lecture for my students mm -hmm. where I was talking about doublets and the fact that in English, like we have cow, but then we borrowed the word beef, which comes ultimately from the same root, like oh, in yeah. the European root, well, ultimately. Um, but then, you know, we see a cow in the field, but beef on the plate. There, I was going to get there. So don't <laughs> sorry, worry. sorry. I, I cut no. off your stream of thought, but I was just like, oh my gosh, I literally just talked about this this morning. I know. Okay. So here we go. But yeah, item one, it's basically like, you know, name of the plant or animal. Sorry. Let me, am I in frame? Name mm -hmm. of the plant or animal equals name of the food. So that's one possibility. Um, another possibility is since you brought it up, mm -hmm. how uh, your speakers came to this food item. 
how they interacted with it, uh, specifically like, like how they were introduced to it or, um, or the context in which they would eat it or come across it. Uh, we can kind of separate these into two because one obvious one is borrowing. So it's like, you know, if you, if you go to English and say, what is the etymology of sushi? You're not going to get very far. It's going to be, we just took this word directly from Japanese. Now, um, there are some interesting things that can happen with this. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, in English, we borrow the word salsa from Spanish, salsa. In Spanish, the word salsa, it, it comes from the same root that gives us sauce and it has pretty much the same meaning. Uh, that is, it is a generic term that we, uh, when we borrowed it, we gave it a specific meaning. So we said that, uh, so now salsa doesn't mean sauce. It means specifically this specific type of like sauce or dressing that is commonly associated with Mexican food. Um, and it doesn't even have to necessarily be the case that it's exactly the same. And now it's just like, okay, well, this is the context in which we knew it. And so now this is the name for this. And now there are probably more salsas that we just said like you know it has like you know it kind of like has its own evolution yeah um in english-speaking countries well and especially with um again back to personal experience um mm -hmm. because i know when we talk about salsa we're often envisioning very different things yeah um for instance david does not accept salsa out of a jar and that to me is salsa but for him it's salsa is very much a fresh thing yeah i mean it's not like it's not salsa it's just bad salsa <laughs> it's a different... i i didn't say you wouldn't accept it as being called it you just wouldn't accept <laughs> it that's, that's right that's what i said True. um but yeah but that also is interesting because um like at some point it became like well mango salsa is a thing yes but like mango salsa doesn't even necessarily need what I would think are the base component parts of salsa, which are tomatoes and it's like tomato, know. onion, cilantro, garlic, salt. Right? Exactly. Yeah. And now you have mango salsa or mm. ooh, one of the recipes I want to try is a nectarine salsa. See, say, things like that, where it's like, how sounds, do you then get? It sounds kind of interesting. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, right. So with, this is, this is borrowing, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So then the other one, because uh, I, I, I did want to mention this. this is, it's like kind of borrowing, but kind of not. Mm -hmm. um, but this is exactly the issue that you raised earlier in your class. So the reason that we have these specific doublets in English is because of the way that English speakers interact with them. So the Norman conquest happened in England, brought over a whole bunch of vocabulary for a number of reasons. Mm -hmm. But um, in particular, there was a dynamic where the French, uh, the, the Norman invaders were the ruling class and the English were the servant class. And so what would happen is the um, servant class would have to speak a little bit of French or have no French terminology when they were serving and speak English at home. And so consequently, when they were serving, you know, the Normans, they would present a dish and say mouton, which is the word for lamb. Uh, then, of course, you go home and you're just eating lamb or sheep. Then I would say sheep specifically because sheep, yeah. veal would be lamb. I thought veal was calf. Oh, it was veal calf? Yes. I thought it was lamb. Mm -hmm. Oh, I am wrong. Mm -hmm. Sometimes also you get you just use food terms wrong because you just. That's true. But then sometimes that catches on. This can happen with any vocabulary. Sometimes you just use the term wrong, but then like it makes sense. People start using it. As a really random side note. Yeah. But it's related. Yeah. Okay. So sheep, lamb, whatever, right? Yeah. Mutton. Mm -hmm. I think the only context in modern English where you use mutton to refer to the actual sheep animal is in rodeos. Because you do mutton busting. Oh my goodness. And that's for kids. And kids go out and they, they wrestle the sheep. It's, they're, they're mutton busting. <laughs> okay but but that's just to say that yes mutton refers to sheep yeah. veal you're right that is calf what was i thinking I oh my god that's so embarrassing yeah, that's fine but um i don't eat veal really so yeah but oh yeah so that was the point so mouton is how you would say it in french but then this just got borrowed in english as mutton and mutton. then <laughs> and then it 
it introduced a distinction that didn't exist before in English and didn't exist in French, which was this is the animal and this is its meat. Mm -hmm. And we had a couple of those. So cow and beef was another one. Pig and pork. Uh, pig and pork is another one. And I think chicken and poultry is one, I think. It may be, but now, of course, poultry now refers to the larger umbrella term of any bird, because poultry yeah. to me could be living animals or things you're eating, but it's turkey, chicken, you know, like it's right. all the birds. I would not include emu. Interesting. Mm -mm. It's a bird. Yeah. But definitely not poultry for me. Anyway, <laughs> um, wait just a second. There was pig, pork, cow, beef. Um, I swear there's more. Oh, deer and venison. Yes, deer and venison. That was the other one I think I was thinking of. Right. Uh, and so now there's this productive distinction. Something interesting that you will see is that there are a lot of cotlingers who pick up on this because we have this distinction. And so they will just go to create their conlang and say, oh, all right, well then let's just do this across the board. And this is the word for the, um, for the animal and this is the word for its meat and often come up with two entirely unrelated terms that are just two brand new roots. Uh, without understanding the history of why we have this distinction at all, at all in English, which is interesting. Um, and I think that's always a question you need to ask yourself. It's not like it's wrong to say this is going to be a root and this is going to be a root. Ultimately, you have to decide certain things are going to be roots. Um, but I think that you think about like, is this something that makes sense mm -hmm. just by itself? Is this something I want to do for my speakers or should it have the kind of history that you see with some of the terms like we have in English. Well, and I think sometimes people then forget that just because we have it for some of our major meats that are eaten, it doesn't exist for all of them. Cause right. like fish, you catch a fish, you eat a fish, like mm -hmm. it's just fish. Um, and so there are a lot that we don't do that for. And I mean, same with like in general chicken cause turkey, you eat turkey, you mm -hmm. eat chicken. So it's like, it doesn't exist for everything. And I think sometimes, um, People forget that too, but like, I think a better strategy, if you don't want it to be the same would be to have one root that means meat or flesh or whatever, and then potentially do some sort of compounding or derivation strategy, whereby you take like cow plus meat and now equals the thing you eat, right? Like that would potentially be a better way to handle it. Or maybe like a unique root for the thing they eat most often, just because it's so common that they have a word for it yeah and other things don't or or if there's a real distinction seen between the two for example um the one place where this does exist in spanish is with pes, which is the word for fish and pescado which is fish that you eat which is oddly enough a distinction we don't really have in english no um and by don't really we just don't i mean yeah i guess you're right i was, I was thinking seafood but um but that's all but no. yeah yeah you're right fish no it doesn't and the idea, I think, with uh, with basing pescado in Spanish is that pescado is something that was fished up mm -hmm. because the the ago ending is a um, past participle ending. It gets used a lot in derivations in Spanish. So, for example, you may have heard of carne asada. Carne is meat, and asada means like grilled or broiled or something like that, yeah, yeah. barbecued. Um, and it comes from asar, right? And then asada with the, uh, that agrees with carne, which is feminine. Um, and so it's like, you know, grilled meat. And so like, there are a lot of these where it's just like the, essentially the ED ending, right? Just got used for just a straight up noun because we're like, well, we don't need the noun that it's referring to. It's just the adjective and that's enough to get you there. Um, and so then you get something like pescado. Uh, which is what you'll see on the menu. You won't see this. That's just uh, it's just for the fish that's swimming around. Uh, another interesting distinction, though, um, since we're talking about this uh, comparing language to language, is what uh, will be a count noun, and what will be a mass noun, and then what will be most commonly plural, and when, what will be most commonly singular. Mm -hmm. So in English, we have seafood, which is a mass noun. In Spanish, you have marisco, which means like something from the sea, like or like a piece of seafood, and mariscos in the plural is seafood. And so then you will see that everywhere, mariscos for seafood. But it's a count noun and it's plural most commonly. 
in English, we do the mass noun thing, I think, a lot. Yeah. Right. For food items. For, yeah. It, for meat, right? So it's like, for example, like. Oh, yeah, specifically for meat. Yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm, because we're on that discussion. Because, yeah, you're right. Like, in terms of vegetables and fruits, we're much more likely to have the count noun versions outside of things like corn or peas, which was a, which became sort of mass noun by accident. Yeah. Um, but outside of those, yeah, it's, well, and, and then grains too, because you just have flour. Rice, and, yeah, and but not beans. No beans, no. They're, t I guess, slightly too big. Because you can, you can count them. Even the small ones, lentils. Yeah, but then you get too small quinoa. Yeah. And you lose it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Quinoa is uh, one of my favorite words, by the way. Mm. I worked very briefly as a transcriptionist. That was the thing. Um, and I, because I apparently have good vocabulary, I got targeted to, to do medical transcription. Anyway, it was crazy. But one of the transcription tests, they needed to make sure that, you know, you could pass the test. And so they had you listen to this recording. And one of the words that they specifically worked into conversation was quinoa. And it was like, you're doing that just to make sure that people know how to spell this word because it's so random. And it's like, if you know how to spell that word, then chances are you'll be okay. <laughs> like I knew that was the target word out of the entire test for it. Um, but yeah, it was like a test for like you, it was a timed test and you had to listen and type everything. You were a transcriptionist? For a very brief while, yeah. You want to tell us a little bit about this? But then they realized that I, they started sending me really hard files. Not only were they medical, so it was like, well, now I need to know all these medical terms. But then they were like, oh, this one can actually like hear dialectal differences and started sending me all of these files that were like really thick, like Bostonian accents and things like that. And so like, I was really struggling. So at that point I was putting too much time into the transcriptions cause I'd have to go much slower. Um, so I wasn't making enough per hour to justify it anymore. So I was like, I'm done. So key thing, if you're gonna be a transcriptionist for a company, don't be too good at your job. Otherwise you're gonna start getting files that mean you're not making your money's worth. Yeah, I don't know I'm not. You're going the wrong I, It doesn't matter, it's good. Um, Oh, there we go. Um, but yeah, no, I, I was, quinoa though was a key word. And key word. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, I love a, a bad mm -hmm. play on words. Yeah. Um, but, but yes, I do like quinoa as well. Yeah. All right. So where are we going? Uh, oh, okay, okay, okay. So this this was like how to come up with food terms, and we were doing the the two different types of borrowing there. Um, all right. So now moving on to other ways that you can come up with uh, with words for for food. Another one is has to do with preparation. Mm -hmm. So that's either how you prepare it or what you prepare it in. Right. And so, like, for example, like, uh, carne asada, if you've ever had it, has a very, very particular flavor, right? And so it's, it's, it, 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 it's quite a specific thing that I think that once you've had it for a little bit, you can recognize that is much more specific than its name would suggest, which is just grilled meat. Mm -hmm. There are tons of ways that you can grill meat, and there's tons of different types of meat that you can grill. Um, and however, it was just like this is a characteristic way of making this type of meat, and that became the name for it, uh, and it became a lexical item. Um, so that if you were just going to talk about grilled meat in Spanish, it'd be you needed more prolix expression to make sure that people knew what you were talking about, or specifically knew that you weren't talking about the thing that it's usually associated with, right? Very specific thing we have in English, mm -hmm. obviously borrowed, kebabs. And that's really interesting because as you're talking about the preparation and kebabs could be a variety of things on them because yeah. you could have veggie kebabs, you could have tofu kebabs, you could have, you know, and a lot of times you're going to have beef or whatever. But like 
it's a very specific type of preparation and they could be served on the shish kebab or not mm. but anyway this sounds like it comes from arabic I, i'm really curious what the uh the etymology would be i'm going to look it up so keep talking and is it it's really a shish kebab right like i didn't just yeah it's shish kebab yeah. and now that i'm saying it though that sounds so wrong like that can't be right but yeah you can because if someone invites you over and says, oh, for dinner, we're having kebabs, it, it doesn't have to be on the rod still. Um, and if I'm just now realizing that maybe not everybody's familiar with what this is, because we do have people from all over the world, That's and this true. may be a very American interpretation of what it means, um, but it's often on like a, a metallic rod of sorts often. Um, and you stick essentially like a variety of foods. So like if it's a veggie kebab, it may be like a chunk of onion, followed by a chunk of pineapple and a chunk of um, green pepper, you know, like, so you just kind of put these chunks of things on the rod and then you grill it. So, you know, usually it's gonna be like covered in oil, maybe some seasonings or whatever, but you put it on a grill and then you rotate the kebab. There's a, there's oh, there a, we go. There's, there's an image if you're, <laughs> if you're watching this. And again, like, then you can also do like meat on the kebab, but it's all things that have to be cut relatively the same size because you're going to be grilling it all at once. So it needs to cook evenly and cook all the way through. Um, but then you can serve it on the, on the kebab still. So like yeah. actually give people a rod of food that they then have to take off to eat. But you could also like take it off after you're done grilling it and then serve it as like, you know, like with rice or whatever and, and, and serve it that way. But like, that's something super specific um, but also not because you never know what you're going to be getting. So like if someone invites you over for kebabs, it's not like, you know, exactly what you're getting in the meal. You just know how it was prepared. Yeah. By the way, so I was it's right. It's really interesting. Yeah. By the way, I was right. Kebab comes from Arabic where it just means, uh, roasting or, or oh. grilling or burning. Yeah. It comes from that. And now it, for us as a, as yeah. having borrowed it, it has to be on a rod. Yeah. And well, well, let me, let me specify. So it started off that way mm -hmm. and then it eventually turned into, um, roasting by turning. Okay. Okay. So that, <gasps> yeah. Which is the Derna kebab. Yes. Oh my God. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Derna. Yeah. But that comes from Turkish. Turkish. Yes. yes. Shish also comes from Turkish. So that we, we got it from Turkish. It ultimately came from Arabic, but the shish part comes from Turkish and shish means skewer. Okay. Okay. So that's why. Yep. Because if you say, and we've shortened it to the point in America where you say kebab, that's what you think of. But when I lived in Germany, um, if people were talking about kebab, they were really talking about the Duna kebab. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I don't know what, I don't know what that word means in Turkish, but I, I was just looking at it. So I want to Oh, it would have to, because it's the big turny thingy that they then, like, they, they not scrape. Yeah, it is kind of scrape, because they run the knife as it's turning to get the meat off. And it's a really big one. There we go. And I'm super curious to know where it comes from. To turn. To turn. Oh, yeah, yeah sure. Obviously. Yeah. Okay. So that is... Well, look at this. Look at this. This is how unsuited Arabic is as a script for Turkish. It's pronounced duna, and then this is d u n r uh -huh. because that's the that's the best that's the best you could do. <laughs> there's, no, there's no u uh in Arabic. There's not even an o. But you know, some other some other podcast day can be on. The, the horribleness of matching one script to another language that was intended for a different language. That would be fun. That would actually be really fun. Yeah. Okay. But right. moving forward, yeah. kebab was an example of like how something was prepared. Yes. Being a name. Right. And then, um, so then others are, there are lots of dishes named after types of pots, aren't there? There are. Casserole. Yes. Casserole. Oh my gosh. I don't want to make a casserole. No, um, I want you to make a casserole. <laughs> casserole is for dynamite. <sighs> but, but yeah, because again, you don't know what you're going to get in a casserole. And there's a, mm -hmm. a variety of them, but definitely. But not everything fixed in a casserole dish is a casserole, such no. as lasagna. Yeah, absolutely not. It cannot be called a casserole, but you definitely make it in a casserole dish. Yeah. So, um, okay, so then... 
I mean, we could probably come up with loads more of examples, but, yes. but yeah, so it's like uh, one, you know, one way to come up with vocabulary, the thing that it's made in. Uh, and I think that you will always find that this is the case, you know, as, as Jesse just pointed out, um, it'll, it'll take its name from the thing that it's made in, but that's not the only thing that dish is used for, but yeah, it's just like, I don't know, it, you do it enough that it's just like, well, whatever, this is going to be the name for this thing. And then you just roll with it. Um, and then, of course, something else that you make in that type of a dish has to have another name from somewhere else. Right. Yeah. And I think that is, and it's really fascinating. Um, and it, that makes it difficult for conlanging specifically, mm. how that example in particular, um, where a casserole is a super broad term yeah. and gets used like for so many different types of food. Um, but then it's like trying to explain to a non-native speaker or a, somebody who's not familiar with the culture why something like lasagna couldn't fit into that category. And there's no rhyme or reason other than the fact that lasagna means something super specific and it doesn't fit our very broad, very generic definition for what a casserole can or cannot be. Um, and so that is also like, it's really fascinating, but can be daunting really when you think about it in terms of conlanging, because it's, it's up to you to decide how these speakers will or will not use these terms. Yeah. And it's like, it's weird because it's like, it feels like to me, just in terms of, um, lexical creation and lexical expansion, uh, I often don't sit down to create food terms and be like, I like, oh, I need one of these, you know, which is too bad because it's like, we spend as humans so much time mm -hmm. preparing and eating and thinking about food um, and talking about it. But I don't know, it's just something that I personally rarely get to in God And I mean, I totally understand that because even yeah. though we do spend as humans a lot of time on food, I don't think a lot of what we translate or want to translate for conlangs necessarily involves food. Yeah, which is interesting because on the conlang list a while back, we had talked about doing a recipe exchange, kind of like, um, kind of like uh, the uh, the relay, the conlang relay. But it's like somebody would make a recipe and then translate it, and they're thinking like you would actually like you know translate it and then make it and see if. Right. Uh huh. I mean, oh my gosh! Could you imagine a Discord channel specifically for that, and then all the pictures that would result for like that would actually be kind of cool. So like, rather than a relay, it'd be like, okay, this month we're doing this person's yes. language yes. and recipe, uh, and see who gets closest. And, yeah. and the prize is, of course, pride. Yeah. Well, also getting something that tastes good as opposed well, to. Yeah, that's very true. Because that's one thing, like if you if you mess up a relay text, it's funny. If you mess up a recipe. <laughs> Disaster. I will say though, that I mean, also though that's very subjective, whether you like the food or not, even if you did everything correctly, that doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna enjoy the, the plate of food you're eating. Yeah, but it's like. But you do get the pride of knowing you actually did it. You know, in my language, we have the same word for cornstarch and powdered sugar. <laughs> which, which is just powdered white. That is totally possible. Mm -hmm. And as a side note, powdered sugar has cornstarch in it. So it does. That's what holds it together. Powdered sugar if you look at the ingredients on the back has cornstarch. Oh, and I know this because I used to be a, an at-home baker, another thing I've done. Um, and one of my specializations was working around, um, I did everything vegan baking, but then I also worked around other food allergies beyond what vegan baking would work around. And somebody needed corn-free cupcakes. And that is the hardest order I have ever had to do because corn is in everything, including the cornstarch and powdered sugar. Well, I, let me just say this. If you are preparing a dish, for example, that uh, my family refers to as snow logs, which is bananas uh, uh, cut in half long ways and then chopped up with peanut butter top uh, on top and then powdered sugar on top of that, 
it is a very different experience if you dump powdered sugar on top versus cornstarch. I did not say all of powdered sugar was cornstarch. I simply said there is cornstarch in powdered sugar, and that's what gives it its ability to be used in frostings because the cornstarch helps it bind. Mm -hmm. And if you say make your own powdered sugar, speaking from experience, where you literally grind white sugar and then try to use that, you're not going to have anything to bind it and the frosting won't hold. Huh. And so at that point, you can still sprinkle it on stuff and it's going to be sugar. So great, but you won't be able to have anything that that needs to be bound. Yeah, of course, you know, with vegan, the, the eggs are right out. So is there anything else that could replace that? Well, you wouldn't put eggs in frosting. Either. I'm just thinking it's a binding agent. Yeah, you totally replace it. With what? Oh, my like all of my baking doesn't have eggs in it. No, 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 no. I'm saying without the cornstarch. Oh, well, that was what the flax seeds were for. And whenever I asked for the pancakes, anyway, I made pancakes the other day. Flax and seeds or what did you just do? Um, I think I, did I stop recording? No, it's still recording. We're good. But flaxseed with water is called a flaxseed egg. And you can, um, I don't know what happened. It just beeped at you. You're you're super sure. Okay, no, no, it's recording. Okay, yeah, we're sorry. good. All right, all right. But yeah, that's how. You, that's one way to make an egg. Another way is you can use mashed bananas. You can use applesauce. Um, canola mm -hmm. oil in variation with other ingredients can be egg replacement. Okay. And so no, there's a lot of things. Of course, but I am asking about cornstarch replacement. Well, how so? I'm you said that without the cornstarch, the powdered sugar for frosting. Die. Yes. Yes. And in there, there is nothing I figured out. Nothing. Mm -mm. And so if anybody knows how to make frosting bind, like a, like a, a frosting frosting that you can swirl on top of a cupcake, how you can make that bind without any dairy, egg, corn, tree nut or peanut products. Let me know. Because also the butter that I typically used was out because it has corn in it. What about maple syrup? <laughs> I mean, you're going to have a very runny frosting, but I'm asking how are you going to get a frosting that you can swirl? Like not royal frosting. Maple syrup, syrup is really thick. It also melts very easily and it's a very liquidy thing at room temperature. Huh. Yeah. And it runs. Uh, Hints that you some pancakes. Yeah, I know, but then like, you know, if you put the sugar in there, it'll keep it from running. No, because sugar without the cornstarch actually makes things runnier. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Um, so uh, another, uh, but by the way, this brings up another uh, possibility when it comes to uh, nomenclature for uh, food items, which is uh, what it looks like. So um, this dish that, uh, this dessert that we have in, in my family, which is, you know, the, their, their bananas cut in half long ways and then you, you chop them up into little chunks and then you put uh, peanut butter on top of them and then powdered sugar on top. We call them snow logs because they look like little logs because of the brown from the peanut butter. And then the powdered sugar is the snow. Other, other, American dessert items, it's very American as far as I'm concerned, is mm -hmm. ants on a log. Right. Ants on a log, you take celery, fill it with peanut butter, and put raisins on top. And it's called ants on a log. Yeah. And then uh, another one, uh, this one, oh, also something else I want to bring up. Um, the multiplicity, especially with popular food items, uh, the multiplic multiplicity of names. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, one one that's very familiar is the submarine sandwich, which just because of the shape of the of the bread, we call it a submarine. Um, Shortened to sub most frequently. Yep. Yeah. Uh, but then, of course, it, it's famous in America for having a bunch of other names as well, like hero. a hobby hero, grinder. Mm -hmm. and... Those are the main ones. Um, yeah. But then, and that again, then not only do we get this overlap of a very generic name for names. Um, but then on mm. the, the flip side, um, like a Philly cheesesteak is none of those could be called a hoagie. Definitely not a sub though. 
Really? A Philly cheesesteak? Yeah, I call them stuff. Really? Oh, yeah. don't don't do that in Philadelphia. <laughs> um, but like there are specific associations then with with again with certain types of food. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, I was thinking in in Spanish. Sometimes it's not based on. Maybe it is based on what they look like, or I don't know exactly why it's called this, but you know, burrito, which is just burrito, which is the suffix added to burro, which is a little donkey. Um, and I, I never thought through that. Really? Oh. That's amazing. Yeah. But you're, well, obviously you're right, but like, <laughs> I never thought through the connection of um, burro and burrito. Yeah. Even though I know the Ito suffix, like <laughs> I just never made that connection. That's amazing. Why is it called a little donkey? I don't know. I don't know. But in, does it make you kick like a donkey? I was looking this up, but it's actually backwards. So dolma in, in Turkish comes from to be filled, um, you know, dolma. And the reason why I was wondering about that is because a pen in Turkish is dolma kalem. Uh, kalem is pencil, and then dolma kalem is pen. And so I thought maybe a dolma was something that looked like a pen, but it's the other way around. It's a something that looks like a dolma. Side note, I had no idea or what dolma was until you showed me that picture. Filled pencil. Yes. Exactly. Really? But I didn't know what that was. So for anybody who is like me and wondering what did David just say, it's D-O-L-M-A. So you can look that up. And it looks like a it looks like a, a grape leaf or a fig leaf, maybe wrapped around things that are filled inside. That's why. Why is it called a burrito? Because of the little, the little, the little things. When you when you load a donkey. On either side of his saddle, you you roll up the little like blankets to carry stuff, and that's what they look like. Oh my word! I never would have made that connection. So this is like a connection through a connection. Yeah. Of, this is what the food looks like. It looks like the roll that you get on the side of a pack donkey. Yes. And and then we're gonna call that a little donkey. Yeah. Because why not? <laughs> wow. Wow. Okay. So this is again, like why it's so exciting to think about food items for your conling speakers, but also why it's so like incredibly mind bendy <laughs> because, and all of these quite often exist side by side in any given language. You have things named after the dishes that they're cooked in, the, the ingredients they have in it, what they look like, like all of these strategies. Like I, I don't obviously know all the languages of the world, but I, I can't imagine people wouldn't use all strategies at hand to name foods. Right. No. That is amazing. <laughs> okay. All right. And then um, I guess uh, we're, we're, we're nearing the end of our time, but uh, we should have written this down in a systematic fashion. We should have. I mean, we should do lots of stuff. <laughs> But I'm also on my second thing of coffee. You will notice that I switched from my, my Christmas mug to my travel mug because this was keeping the backup coffee warm while I drank the coffee that was open in the mug. Uh, I thought you were just going to pour this into that. No, that could make a mess. So I'd rather just drink out of the mug as, yeah, as intended. I got that. Um, coffee mm. comes from the bean that it's made out of, the name coffee. Oh, yeah. Obviously, yeah, that's how we make it, too. But it's literally bean water is yeah. what I'm drinking. Which is also, by the way, a very obvious way uh, for having open names for dishes just to use its component parts mm -hmm. or its or some of its most characteristic parts. So, like, you know, what is uh, bread pudding? It's a pudding that uses bread. Mm -hmm. um, and then, like, well, apple pie, strawberry pie. Sure. Yeah. Sorry, but then I just started thinking like coffee, right? And then you think, okay, it's going to be hot, but then we have to specify hot cocoa. Well, because isn't cocoa a separate thing? It is, but why? Why do we just call this coffee and cocoa is the cocoa powder? If you say cocoa to me, I'm thinking cocoa powder. Yeah, yeah. Um, but cocoa powder is not the only thing you put into hot cocoa. No, it requires much more. Right. And it's hot, not cocoa drink or whatever. We have to specify that it's a hot drink. Mm -hmm. yeah. All of that is now just very fascinating to me that I want to think through. 
Mm. Does hot cocoa come with marshmallows for you? Some people need marshmallows for it to be hot cocoa. That's just silly. I mean, like, you, if you like them, then yes. If you don't, then not. Uh, mm. Like, oh, why would you call it, why would you be persnickety like this? If it's like, if it doesn't have a marshmallow. No, 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 it's not hot cocoa. It's just hot chocolate or something. I don't know. Hot chocolate is also another name for hot cocoa. Yeah, I know. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> and yet, if you say hot chocolate to me, I'm, a, I'm thinking the drink. I'm not thinking, say, a hot chocolate waterfall where we can dip strawberries in. Mm. But there are those. Yeah. What would that be? Chocolate mm. fountain? Yeah, chocolate fountain. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Now I really want some chocolate. <laughs> I mean, luckily we're here where there's a plethora of chocolate available to you. There, there really is. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, there was okay. So to, 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 uh, also just adjective noun combos. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so oh, yes. let me skip that one because I want to get to this one because okay. adjective noun combos are easy. But okay. um, things named after a particular person or a particular place. Sandwich. Earl sandwich. Uh huh. Right. Uh, but also. Um, uh, something like an Arnold Palmer, which Ooh, is a nice. mixture of tea and lemonade, and it was named after Arnold, Arnold Palmer because that's what he would always order. And I struggle with this name, by the way, too many R's and L's together. Uh, um, and so it never comes out right, and I have to really slowly say it. Um, baked Alaska. Yes. Why is it called that? No idea, but it's called that. Oh, and then, oh, oh, German chocolate cake. It's not like named after Germany. It's named after the type of chocolate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And typically German chocolate cake is going to have coconut in it, which yeah. doesn't make sense given. Yeah, yeah which is something I, I really don't like, dried coconut. You know this, right? I do know this and I'm disappointed. It's just plastic. Um, that's okay. I got you eating onions. I can get you on the dried <laughs> coconut wagon eventually. That's so uh and enjoying it um yeah okay so but we have place and people names yeah right you were saying adjective noun combos yeah uh this is a bad example but i was thinking of hot dog uh worst example since yes they are usually hot but definitely not dog yeah no right so um that would be one of the look combos, right? Because didn't it, because it looked like a wiener dog? I think so, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm, I'm just coming up with really bad examples like uh, French fries or. Which could be a place name, but again, misnamed because they should really be Belgian fries. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, that's not a thing. Uh, now I really want French toast. Oh, French toast, right. Uh, something with sweet, there's got to be noun combinations that are sweet, right? Sweet cakes. Uh, sweet meats? There's a, which is not meat. There is, that is a good example, sweet meats. Um, it's, it's not that, but it, it's, a, it's a nice example. Uh, dulce de leche, which is, dulce is just sweet, right? But it's like, it's a milk sweet, mm -hmm. you know? Um, Milk candy is a thing in Japan. Um, and then, hmm, no, it's just. There are examples. I do know. Yeah. It was just like when you said it, I was like, cool, can you give some? Because in my head, I was like, I'm out. Yeah. That's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Fried something, surely. They have fried ice cream. Yeah. Oh, there's also like oatmeal. It's a, it's a compound, right? It is. Yeah. But like, meal. interesting. Usually I think of meal as um, it's got to be totally ground up and oatmeal is definitely not ground oats. Yeah, I mean, it's... They're flattened. They're... Right. They're milled. They are milled. So basically, I think it's just processed. Yeah, yeah processed oats. Yeah. And then we have oatmeal, cornmeal. Um, we don't have goat meal. Goat meal? Yeah, we don't have that. There's no such thing as goat meal. Why would we? Why not? 
milled and processed goats. Really concerned about you now. Uh, any, I'm glad, anyway. I'm glad it took this long. Anyway. Ooh, American cheese. That's a very specific thing. Mm. Um, much better than that is Velveeta. Second only to Prevel. And now you know you like Prevel because he's had Emo's pizza and he likes it. Okay. Yeah, but like Velveeta, come on. There are, there are these types of burritos that you can get in Missouri. all over it pour it on top. no okay so here's what's really interesting to me so like because my association with Velveeta is obviously very different than David's and um when I was growing up like mac and cheese was the standard mac and cheese you know out of the box whatever um the powdered sugar that you gotta put the milk with to, mm -hmm. to make the cheese okay so that was like the standard and it was obviously like very cheap and it was something we could like make easily turn into casseroles yep. by doing things like adding tuna and some veggies and Fantastic. all of a sudden you have an entire meal love it okay but growing up one of our treats like fancy dinner night was the Velveeta and shells version of mac and cheese and so for me like if we had Velveeta omg also, we would then buy the blocks of Velveeta, and that was what my mom used for grilled cheese sandwiches. And so for me, Velveeta is not only comfort food, but also like a fancier thing. And so I always thought it was a nicer kind of cheese. Um, I did not realize until much later in life that people felt very differently about Velveeta. Yeah. But I, I have very positive connotations with Velveeta. And let me tell you, best grilled cheese sandwiches, because that melts and is Ewy gooey, lovely stream. Mm, love it. Dip it in tomato soup. Love, love, love. That's my childhood memory. And a meal. Anyway, I'll be done. It's good. And now I think on that note, it's time to go. <laughs> Best note to end on. Incidentally, though, if you want to talk about names like Velveeta, uh, you, you could probably merge that with a discussion of uh, pharmaceutical nomenclature. Because I think that the basically the same spirit that brought us Velveeta is what gave us Viagra. This is, speaking of, <laughs> yeah. pharmaceutical nomenclature. Um, this is actually, yeah, it's a, a, some, I don't even know what it is, um, but it, Kepra, K-E-P-P-R-A, whatever the next word is. Levitiracetum? Yes. So anyway, this was actually given to me while I was a reading teacher. Mm -hmm. I did that Institute of Reading Development gig for a while. Yeah. You're going to find out I've had lots of jobs. And one of my students, like their dad worked for this pharmaceutical company um, and they gave me this as a thank you gift um, hmm. at the end of the session. And I was like, well, it's kind of cool. It's got like a Lego looking K on one side. So mm -hmm. that was nice. But like it has legit been with me for, oh, going on like 15 years and is the best travel mug because it has a nice base that fits in every cup holder that I've ever had in a car. And it's got a great seal on top. It's easy to get on and off. And it has continued to be my best travel mug, even out of all of the expensive travel mugs I've bought to try to like get something fancier to not have a pharmaceutical drug coffee mug. Um, but it's the best. And so I continue to use it 15 years later. Ooh, going on like 16 years now. Mm. It's good stuff. Wow. Anyway, so I'm advertising for something. I have no idea what it is or what it does. Yeah, makes sense. You'd be a fan. You are a Capricorn. <laughs> but I'm not. I know. <laughs> no, it's just a name for I'm a fan. So not. No, it's just a name for a fan. You're definitely a Capricorn. There we go. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for joining in with this episode on food 
and all of its diversions. Yeah. Um, and now I'm hungry. Yep. But we have to go. Yeah. <laughs> which is unfortunate because I really just want to eat. Um, what I'm really craving right now is some some apples and peanut butter. And that would be really really good. But alas, with powdered sugar. No. <laughs> just no. <laughs> um, we will see you soon. Stay grammar. Stay grammar. Bye.